In this episode of our series, we will continue our discussion from the last video, focusing on the towers and their behavior. We will explore the concept of descent towers and examine how this theory might be supported through the analysis of the wreck of the RMS Titan. First, let's do a brief recap of our previous discussion. We have successfully analyzed the wreck, focusing on the forward tower structure. Our analysis revealed that the forward tower could not have drifted eastward on its own, as structure-wise, it is not built for the hydrodynamic movements that would allow it to drift as it goes down the sea floor. The placement of the forward tower remains a mystery, as it is located far from the hypocenter, though in the video previously theorized that the tower went along with the bow. And here, we have other debris like the aft tower which lie closer to the stern. With this in mind, we will now explore the theory of descent towers to explain the placement of these objects and debris. This is a separate theory from the previous video that we had. The descent tower theory posits that instead of the forward towers breaking off at the surface, they detach as the stern descended. As the ship began to break apart, sections and fragments formed. With these towers remained attached to the stern, slightly dislodged. During the descent of the stern, these towers eventually detached as the stern began its spiral. According to this theory, the former's tower, or also known as the forward tower, was the first to come off, flung away as the stern violently spun. Debris beneath the tower, including the two double bottoms, was thrown eastward. Meanwhile, other debris such as the aft tower detached when the stern was only a few meters from the sea floor and is now located north of the stern. The descent tower's theory gained popularity on a server managed by Blueprint. Initially, the surface tower theory was widely more accepted, which theorized that during the breakup of the Titanic, the superstructures began breaking off as the breakup occurred. However, Further analysis of the forward and aft tower structures led to the decline of the surface towers theory. This shift occurred after Pooley, a Titanic enthusiast, introduced the concept of the descent towers. Enthusiasts like myself along with Dennis, Danny, and Tony embraced this new theory. Subsequently, many others also began to incorporate the descent towers theory into their own analysis and research of the RMS Titanic sinking and breakup. Pooley, the originator of the Descent Towers theory, states, It came about trying to answer the questions of how the forward tower or top of the third funnel casing. We knew from the survivors that there were most likely a third section that formed during the break, with common explanations having it come off the ship at the surface. But with the size and shape of the tower, it freely traveling northeast felt off for multiple reasons. Number one, the current couldn't affect it, as the current that night was only one to two knots south southeast. Number two, hydrodynamics couldn't affect it, as it has no features that would influence the water to guide itself northeast. And lastly, number three, it weighs around 700 to 1,100 tons so it isn't light enough to be influenced by the water alone. It should have just fallen roughly straight down like possibly with the Guggenheim piece. He further says, So I concluded the tower coming off at the surface can't answer this hypothesis. I came to realize something had to influence the forward tower to give it the movement to travel northeast from the hypocenter. Returning to our topic, the Descent Towers theory had actually been popularized 11 years prior. It gained widespread recognition. In the year of 2012, the documentary Titanic The Final Word proposed that the towers detached and formed immediately after the stern's implosion, as for the documentary. However, this theory has its flaws. According to James Cameron, the documentary's developer, and historians like Halpern, the towers formed due to the stern's implosion. However, analyzing the wreck shows that most of the wreckage had selective implosion areas. 
This suggests that the implosion did not generate enough force to form the towers, which are superstructures designed to withstand various environmental conditions. Implosion alone would not be sufficient to tear and form the superstructures that we know today in the wreck as the breakup occurred and where they are in the wreck today. Now let's consider the concepts derived from survivor testimonies. Most survivors distinctly remember the ship breaking at a particular section, generally pointing to a break either in the middle, in front of the third funnel, or amidships. As per all the gathered survivor testimonies, the majority linked into this finding. Here are some examples of such testimonies. The bow of the vessel went down, tipping the stern high in the air. It seemed to then break in two in the middle, and then the whole thing sank. Finally, there was a terrific explosion, like a cannon report, and a big black cloud of smoke arose from the ship. This settled, and the ship appeared to be broken at the middle. Finally, there was a second report, more muffled than the first, and the bodies came over the side of the ship by the hundreds. The ship had gone down right after the second explosion, after the bow was submerged by the water and the propellers were raised up out of the water. With one tremendous roar, which sounded and resounded over the sea, she seemed to break in the middle and sink. It seemed to break in half between the four funnels. The front went down quietly, and the stern stayed up a minute and sank. Testimonies such as these predominantly indicate a break in front of the third funnel. From an examination of the wreck, it appears that the epicenter or primary fracture, as I would term it, began in the same area. As the breakup progressed, additional cracks formed, radiating through the superstructure as stress increased. This stress that scattered by the superstructures on the decks above contributed to the formation and eventual detachment of the towers. Returning to episode 1, where we discussed the ship's breakup, some survivors stated that the break occurred in various areas. How can these align with the theory that the breakup only happened in the middle? In addition to the descent towers theory, which causes a crack form around the towers, which could only and also make it look like it broke in different areas, although we should consider on how dark the night was. Now we can consider also the possibility that debris was mistaken for sections breaking off in different areas of the ship as it began to break apart. Then this leads us to the third funnel. A quick refresher from episode 1, survivors mentioned a piece falling off or sometimes referred to as a third piece. How does this fit with the descent towers theory? This theory incorporates the third funnel. Few testimonies mention the third funnel collapsing, though it is being referred to as indirectly or not exactly mentioning which funnel came to collapse. Given the darkness of the night when the breakup occurred, Survivors might have mistaken the fall of the middle section as which they coded or believed on for the collapse of the third funnel. 
Additionally, the concept of sparks emanating from the third funnel, which will be discussed in a separate video, could give the impression that these are the debris or different sections or a section from the ship were actually coming off from the stern, for which the survivor believed is the middle section that came off from the ship. Though this theory has its flaws, considering the third funnel as the middle section is plausible. Though despite the night being dark, survivor's eye would have adjusted to the dark lighting. Anatomically in a human, our pupils adjust to light levels. They constrict in bright lights to, it, to limit light reaching the retina and dilate in darkness to let in more light, allowing for humans to see in the dark. This means survivor's eye would adapt to the darkness, making the white superstructure of the ship visible. The third funnel, or most of the funnels of the ship rather, are colored in a buff color and distinctly are shaped. This would have been noticeable against the dark backdrop of the night of the sinking. Survivors could distinguish it from other objects as evidenced by accounts describing when the other funnels fell, such as how other survivors were able to see the collapse of funnel number one and funnel number two from different lifeboats. Structurally, they would have also been able to see it clearly as the eyes would have been able to adjust in the dark. Overall, it's difficult to definitively determine which theory is more plausible. Testimonies and survivor accounts lead more towards the surface tower theory, but the analysis of the wreck suggests the descent towers theory. There is no clear answer to what exactly occurred. However, the majority of the community today favors the descent towers theory. Looking back at episode 1 provides, the theory presents a probable way to understand the current placement of the debris. In addition, we may never know what happened and these theories will always just stay as theories and will be never solid into facts to whatever may have occurred on the fateful night of the sinking of the RMS Titanic.